Well, hey, all you wiretappers out there. Guys, I'm back here in the studio. Retired intelligence detective Gary Jenkins. Uh, join me as we navigate the twists and turns of Boston mobster Joseph the Animal Barbosa. His life well, goes from the boxing ring to the criminal underworld and an unexpected role as a key witness in a gangland murder. Gangland Wire is the podcast that brings you an in-depth exploration of these hidden stories that help shape the American mafia. Now, buckle up. Buckle up, I say, as we delve into the shadows of organized crime and betrayal. And I'm going to tell you the story of Joseph the Animal Barbosa. Joseph Barboza was born September 20th, 1932. His criminal career will go from a young thug and boxer to become one of the most notorious mob hitmen for the patriarchal crime family of New England. Starting as a mafia enforcer in the Boston's underworld, he will end his criminal career as an FBI informant in 1967 and enter the witness protection program. He was a star witness at the trial of six men convicted of a 1965 murder of a burglar named Edward Deegan. Four of these accused men were sentenced to death and two others were given life in prison. Eventually, facts will surface that the Boston FBI helped set up these innocent men and used Barboza to help frame these defendants, and they'll become a case of wrongful conviction later on, but not after these guys spend most of their life in the penitentiary. Barbosa himself and Boston Mafia hitman Vincent Fleming actually did this murder. Now, Joseph Barbosa Jr.'s early life seemed destined for a different path. He was raised by Portuguese immigrants. His father, Joseph Barbosa Sr., was a middleweight boxer. His mother, Pamelda Camille, was a seamstress. He was fluent in Portuguese, Italian, and Spanish. Young Barbosa, the animal, hadn't got his nickname yet, but he follows in his father's footsteps and he trained as a boxer. He was ranked as a professional light heavyweight boxer and a member of the United States Boxing Association. He fought under the moniker of the Baron. Barbosa's first boxing match was in April 1949 against a guy named Rocky Lucero down in El Paso, Texas. His last fight was up in Boston, September of 1961. He fought against a man named Don Bale. They say he fought an unorthodox stance and was known for his powerful punches. Barbosa's boxing records show that he won eight out of 11 matches and he had five knockouts. During one of his early brushes with the mob, he sparred with patriarchal crime family associate Americo Sacramone. I don't know if I've got that right or not, but Sacramone. Unable to make a living as a boxer, he will start working as a longshoreman and a general laborer, as a clerk in a fruit store, and he was a small-time criminal, of course. Aren't these guys all that at one time. Now, Barbosa's journey into the criminal underworld begins to unfold during the 1960s. He will become a prominent enforcer and contract, contract killer for the patriarchal crime family. But his story goes beyond the dark alleys and criminal enterprises and the back streets of New England. Beyond the ring, Barbosa's criminal career saw this early thing, 1953, he was in the penitentiary. I'm not even sure what for, but he led the largest prison break in Massachusetts Correctional Institute Concord history. They had a 75-year perfect history of no escapes at this Concord Correctional Institution. A wild escapade involved contraband whiskey, amphetamine tablets, and a daring dice to the streets of Boston. Joseph Barboza and six other fellow inmates guzzled contraband whiskey, took amphetamine pills, overpowered four prison guards, and raced away in two separate cars they commandeered. During this short stretch of freedom, they beat random people on the street, cruised the bars in Boston's downtown red light district, and they were finally apprehended by cops at the subway station in East Boston. This little skate party barely lasted 24 hours, but it created a wide swath and some headlines. You know, and, and three months later, he's waiting trial at a, at a jail for this prison break. He slugs a guard in the cafeteria. Uh, a few months after that, he tossed a table at a guard's chest when he entered his cell. I mean, this guy, he earned his name, The Animal. Now, his entry into the actual organized crime circles and his association with the patriarchal crime family is a tale of dark alliances and blood ties. Despite never being officially inducted 
because of his non-Italian ancestry, Joseph the Animal Barbosa earned a reputation of one of Boston's most prolific contract killers and sidewalk soldiers. He was a street warrior, man. He was, he was like Danny Green down in Cleveland. He was a street warrior. He first became trusted by Boston organized crime members during his time in Walpole Prison. You know, many of these guys, they like, you know, you make your bones in a way, not by killing somebody, but by going to prison and not you know, talking about anybody and then how you conduct yourself in prison. A prison is is like a training ground for a lot of guys. And mob will swats these guys and see how they conduct themselves in prison. And then, you know, then when you get out, you know, they see that you can you can be of use. Yeah, it's a that's Joseph Barboza had such a strong personality that a bar he frequented when he was out was called Barboza's Corner. He was part of a crew supervised by Stephen the Rifleman Flemmy for the Winter Hill Gang. And, and if you remember, Stephen the Rifle Hill Flemmy was, was Whitey Bulger's buddy. As a Winter Hill Gang member and a Patriarch of Crime Family associate, he became one of Boston's most infamous contract killers within the next eight years. They're pretty sure, law enforcement authorities are pretty sure several of his contract murders were for Raymond L.S. Patriarca himself. One time he was faced with legal troubles. He got a six-month sentence for assaulting a police officer. He pretty much stayed out, you know, the mob kept him out of these smaller scrapes. So, you know, this Winter Hill gang is involved with Bulger and Vincent Fleming and his brother Stephen Fleming. And, and these were these Fleming brothers, really his big allies. An unusual side story, Barbosa drove a 1965 Oldsmobile Cutlass, which law enforcement called the James Bond car, because it had a real sophisticated alarm system for the times, and also had some kind of a device that he could kick out thick black smoke out of the tailpipe if somebody was after him. I don't know. First I've ever heard of that outside of James Bond. But this is the early 60s. By 1966, Barbosa's turbulent position in the Boston underworld included surviving some assassination attempts, and he challenged traditional La Cosa Nostra roles, and he was Portuguese, after all, but he was in. He had confrontations with authorities, but he also was demanding protection payments from a lot of people, and that strained some of his relationships within organized crime. For example, one time he tried to extort some protection money from a bar owner who was already paying protection, protection to Gennaro Angelo and he was like the underboss of the Boston part of the New England crime family. In October 1966, there was a falling out between different guys. And, and the Boston mob was kind of like, this guy was such a loose cannon. Uh, they weren't really too big on him right now. He had a weapons charge of some kind. And he claimed later that he learned the patriarcha guys tipped off the police that led to his arrest. He had some accomplices with him. They got out on bail. He had his bail set at $100,000, which, of course, he couldn't afford. And nobody from the Patriarcha crime family came down to help him post his bond or get your friendly bondsman to, to go ahead and, and put down the bond for you. So he, he is not happy with the Patriarcha crime family. He stays in jail. He's isolated from his association from any of these guys. He's heard that they've set him up. And, and this... This is when his journey takes on a web of connections and betrayals. 1967, the Bureau has recruited him to be an informant for a while and, and to end up going into witness protection program. Now, if you remember, I said that he testified against some mafia associates for the murder of a burglar named Edward Deegan. And this was at the behest of the FBI agent, John Connolly and Paul Rico, both of whom will eventually be really implicated and arrested. Connolly spent most of his rest of his life in the penitentiary. Rico died while in custody. Um, Barbosa helped send five innocent men to prison for murder, when in fact he and Vincent Fleming had done this murder. This revelation will unravel a web of deception and wrongful convictions by the Boston FBI. It was a hell of a mess. There are a mellow of ass up in the Boston FBI office for quite a while. It's taken him a long time to live that down. So he's in witness protection. They give him a one-year sentence. Usually, like for some of your old crimes, they give you some kind of sentence. You go to a, a snitch prison, as they call it. The U.S. Marshals will then relocate Joseph Barboza 
1969 under the name of Joseph Bentley to Santa Rosa, California. He had cooking experience, so he enrolled in a culinary arts school. He tried cooking on a ship. That didn't last very long. I think the, the probably the rules on the ship were, were a little bit too rigorous for our friend, the animal. Back in Santa Rosa, he met a 26-year-old criminal named Clayton Ricky Wilson, young guy, you know, trying to make a name for himself. This pair ended up stealing as much as $100,000 together, put that together. Wilson's widow will testify that these two men had clandestine meetings, kept a small stockpile of dynamite, a machine gun, other guns, bulletproof vest, and a, and a tin box that supposedly had over $100,000 in stocks and bonds. They just went out and wife went along with them and another woman, the four of them, couples were out for a walk. And then Barboza got Wilson to walk away from everybody. They heard a gunshot and he come back, came back and he said, OK, let's go. And they didn't question anything for a while until finally the, the body got found. And then one of the women came forward and, and he took a conviction for that. He got five years in Folsom prison under a second degree murder charge. Probably had to bargain it down. You know, you know, your whole conviction was based on this one woman who wasn't actually an eyewitness. And, you know, so he, he, he copped a plea and it's a pretty good plea. Five years for a murder. That's pretty good. You know, interesting thing about Barbosa, while he was in prison, he wrote poems. Go figure. <laughs> they, had, they had titles like Boston Gang War, Mafia Double Cross, Cat's Lives, The Gang War. I mean, this guy, he was a piece of work, wasn't he? Shortly after his release from this five-year sentence, 1976, the Boston mob, of course, they had located him. Everybody knew who he was by then. He'd come out of witness protection. He did take on another... Pro name, as we call it, a uh, nom de plume, a nom de war, nom de gear, no, name of war. Joseph, and he's living in San Francisco under that. And February 11th, 1976, and Joseph the Animal Barbosa is walking to his car, and the hit team found him. They'd been watching him for a while, and he was hit by sh four shotgun blasts at close range. They've he was armed with a Colt 38 at the time, but he didn't have a chance to get it out. They caught him. They caught him unawares. Now, find out later that Gennaro Angelo dispatched his hit team from Boston. And actually, they picked it up on another wire where Angelo's remarking about one of the hit men. His last name was Russo. And, and, and what a good job he did taking out Joseph the Animal Barbosa. So that's the story of Joseph the Animal Barbosa. It, it's a heck of a story. And I really appreciate y'all tuning in. You know, I highly recommend if you've been in the service and you have any problems with PTSD, you go to the VA website and get that hotline number. You know, I always say this, alcohol and drug abuse go hand in hand with PTSD. So if you got a problem with that, go to see our friend Anthony Ruggiano down in Florida, former Gambino soldier, is a drug and alcohol counselor down there now. He's got a hotline number on his website or his YouTube channel. Let me know if you ever do that. Don't forget, I like to ride motorcycles, so watch out for motorcycles when you're on the streets and like and subscribe and give me a review. Don't forget, I've got movies out there on Amazon, so check them out. Gangland Wire, the story of behind the story of the skimming from Las Vegas from the Kansas City viewpoint. The war between the Savella brothers and the Spiro brothers called Brothers Against Brothers. I've got a book called Leaving Vegas. That's that's the story from the Kansas City view of the skimming investigation in Las Vegas casinos. So thanks a lot, guys. Keep coming back.